Hey everyone, my name is Slavic, and today I have a guest with me. He's been a mentor and someone that I look up to, even though I think you might, you might be a little bit shorter than me, but other than that... <laughs> I think I'm taller than you. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I think there's a lot of things that um, I love what you do in my, my life, where you come and you call me out at times uh, for things that I preach. And um, I know that in those moments, it doesn't necessarily feel good, to be clear. Um, but I think that's really necessary. And today I want to talk with him about some of the things that, you know, he has seen in the church for the last, I think, 43 years you, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So would you just tell us a little bit about yourself? And then we're going to go into some of the things you learned in the process of being a member of a church, serving the church, and so on. Okay, so uh, I'm 71 years old and uh, didn't come to know the Lord until I was 29 years old. Mm -hmm. Moved up here from L.A., started practicing law in 1974, got befriended by somebody who invited me to church, and I got exposed to the gospel. Intellectually, I knew what it was, but uh, it wasn't until Easter of 1977 that mm -hmm. the Lord finally connected my mind to my heart and I was born again. So uh, over that period of time, uh, I grew slowly at first because I was so busy in my law firm that grew from 30 lawyers to 250 lawyers in 17 years. Uh, but over time, God uh, gave me a passion for him and his truth and uh, for praise and worship and for discipleship. Uh, and it was an, an it's been an incredible walk with the Lord. Uh, so we have been in many different types of churches and environments. Uh, I shocked my family and friends and quit my law practice at age 42, said I was going to go serve the Lord with my children uh, who were homeschooled and uh, didn't know what I was going to do. People thought we were crazy, but we waited on the Lord and prayed for a year and a half and spent a year in Bulgaria as missionaries from 92, 93, came back, totally transformed people because we saw what God can do in the hearts of people that have no hope but him. And so our passion since then has been to grow in our knowledge and relationship with Christ and uh, become better stewards of our time and his word. Uh, fortunately, I didn't go back to my big law firm and I've been able to uh, live a very relaxed life doing what most of you have been doing since the coronavirus shut down, <laughs> staying at home. I uh, practiced yeah. law out of my home since 1996, and it's been a joy because I've had time for things that God puts on my heart. Yeah, and uh, I uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this podcast is uh, we meet from time to time for about an hour or so, and we had some amazing conversations. And I think one particular reason that I wanted to, to bring this to a podcast is that I think there's a disconnect between the older generation. I mean, I mean I'm not saying that like you're old or anything, um, but I think there's been a disconnect between people that um, are a bit older than us and, and the younger generation. And I think that is really, you know, bad. And the reason for that is because we learned how to just kind of do our own thing. And there's a huge gap in knowledge, there's a huge gap in 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 between our generations, mm -hmm. and it's it's problematic because instead of actually learning from the experiences uh, of your life and and people like you, we sort of just kind of turn the other way and we try to think on our own what church should be like and so on. But no matter how well I study, I will never have the life experience that Chip you have by far. Um, just because maybe one day when I'm at your age, I'll have that life experience. But right now I don't have that. And I think it would be a great idea to tell us what you have learned about the church. Um, I know you've been part of a lot of different churches, uh, be it because you're moving or maybe you're doing missionary uh, work uh, overseas. And um, our conversations, especially when we get together in the morning, man, we see a lot of the movements that start out very well and very good, but then they turned to either a, a man-made theology or they got stuck on a particular thing that then it ends up kind of destroying the church and destroying the people in the church. Um, so the whole point of this is not to, you know, point fingers at other churches. The whole point of this is because I've been doing this for about 16 years. You've been doing this for way longer we love the church. 
we love the local church. I think the local church is the hope of the world. But if we are to be the people of God, we need to do an honest look on how do we follow after Jesus. So let's first talk about what the church should be, right? And then we can talk about some of the abuses that we see in, in the mainstream and so on. So in your opinion, what do you think the church should be? That's a beautiful question. Uh, it's one that uh, I've struggled with for a long time because we've been in mm -hmm. many different types of churches uh, over the years and learned a lot along the way. But I think the best model for the church is the Word of God. We need mm -hmm. to look at the Word, understand it, internalize it, obey it, and then when we surrender our desires and passions and prejudices to Christ, and he lives in us, then the church can function like it's supposed to. You'll note that the New Testament consists, after the four Gospels, of one book of Acts, written by Luke, that talks about how the church spread, and then the rest of the New Testament is really addressing problems within the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things that the Apostle Paul, that Peter, that John, that James saw that were not consistent with the word. And so the whole orientation was, please look at what I'm teaching, look at what Christ taught, mm -hmm. and don't look at the ways of man and get off. So uh, what is the church? What does the church of Christ really look like? First and foremost, it is Christ-centered mm -hmm. in every respect. It's committed, committed to personal and corporate prayer. Jesus mm -hmm. said, my house shall be a house of prayer. And if you're in a church and they're not praying, you got to turn up the fire or you got to find a place that is because nothing happens unless yeah. God's people pray. So Amen. there's prayer. There's a passion for the word of God and a desire to be led by, not controlled by or manipulated by, but led by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. There's lots of false spirits that uh, come in that get people off. And when there's too much focus on the Holy Spirit and it takes you off of the word that became flesh, Christ himself, then you can get into trouble. So uh, there's usually a heartfelt personal and corporate worship and God-honoring praise. There's lots of different styles of praise and worship. Not one size fits all. Yeah. But there is worship that is focused on glorifying God and the blessings of being children on, on a good balance. It's not all me songs. It's not all hymns. But it's just passionate and sung from the heart. Mm -hmm. Another thing that characterizes the true church that you see in the book of Acts, the way the apostles act, there was no fear of man, but there's yeah. a healthy fear of the Lord. So many people downplay fear of the Lord, but that's a good thing because it keeps us close to the Lord. So uh, another beautiful aspect of a healthy Christian church is that there's no big distinction, gulf between the pastors and the laity. Mm -hmm. God says in his word that we are all royal priests, yeah. that we are to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ, imploring people to be reconciled to God. There's one pastor and you've got 200 other people. And if they're sitting there doing nothing and expecting one pastor to do it all, you're going to have a dysfunctional church. Yeah. Can we stop there for just a second? Because I think it's such a big subject. I mean, every single church has some kind of form of government, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have a congregation sort of led church, right? Where people just sort of vote up and down. <laughs> What's the next thing? Or then you have a, a, a church where there's a elder board, right? That, that sort of controls the vision of the church and so on. And then you have a, a form of governorship where it's usually a pastor. There's, it's all in be all in, you know, he's in charge of everything. Um, so I think all of those models, you know, have certain benefits, but then they, you know, they might not exactly be biblical. For example, the church, I don't believe the church is a democracy where everyone votes what they want in. Because if you put truth to a vote, usually a lot of times you would lose. So what would be a healthy approach to church governorship, right? Like, is it the elder model? Is it, you know, the pastoral model? Is it, uh, what would you say in that, re in the, with that respect? Well, First of all, one person shouldn't know everything and be responsible yeah. for everything and be accountable to nobody. So uh, there's also a huge problem when the pastor knows who's giving what money because the yeah. tendency is to favor the guy that's giving the bucks and to ignore the people that uh, might be really, really valuable members of the body of Christ. Uh, I think 
Governance is one thing, but it should be distinguished from another thing that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, and that is the importance of the five-fold ministry. ministry yeah. What is the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is to equip the saints, that's you mm. and me and everybody, to do the works of the Lord, because that pastor can't do it all. So we need to have apostles, we need to have pastors, we Prophets, need to have yeah. teachers, we need to have prophets. Prophets are rarely embraced because they're doing what I do to Slavic yeah. every now and then. <laughs> I'm going to come and say, hey, bro, I think you missed something here, and then point them back to something. that yeah. Because we are all blind to yeah. our prejudice and things that uh, uh, we're oblivious to, and that's why we need to be in a community. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Love that answer, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it, 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 there has to be a balance because the moment you go into one direction or another, um, for me, it's always been, you know, when I see a, a, a structure of a church where the pastor is sort of like the CEO on top and everyone's sort of beneath them. And I look at Jesus, I'm like, wait a second, Jesus, who's the son of God, did not count himself, you know, to, to be too important to wash the disciples' feet. And here, a lot of times we have a pastor that is on top of the pyramid per se. I'm like, no, I think if you are the most impor important person, you should be serving the whole exactly. church. Um, so there has to be a balance, you know, uh, of how we look at church, you know, um, governorship and also a church uh, structure. So with that said, kind of have an idea of what the church should be. What are some of the things that you see where, uh, and, and it, to me, what's so interesting is most of the people, when they wake up and they want to follow the Lord, nobody wakes up and, and decides, oh, I, want, I just want to be deceived. Or like, hey, I just want to go to the congregation of the deceived, right? Like nobody, everyone, unless, you know, you are not of the Lord, right? Like unless you are actually pursuing, you know, the enemy. <laughs> but most of the, the Christians, I would say, when they give their heart to the Lord, they don't want to be deceived, you know? So how do we end up from hey, someone that gave their life to the Lord, but then they join a movement that is not biblical, you know? And how, how did those movements even start? You want to give us a little bit of insight to that? Well, they started when Jesus died. And the Holy Spirit <laughs> came yeah. down in power. And yeah. since then, it's gone on and on. For years, there was only the Catholic Church, and uh, we had the Dark Ages, and mm -hmm. then the Reformation, the Renaissance, and we had revivals along the way. And different ministries started. Mm -hmm. That's where we get our denominations w with the Methodists and the Baptists. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. all based on revivals that started. Mm -hmm. But the true Church of God is organic. It's based upon Christ living in the hearts of the people mm -hmm. that he has come into, and it's based upon their surrender and a desire to be one with him. Uh, and, and so really, uh, I, I think we can talk about particular churches and types right. of churches as we go along the way. But I must say, much like we saw in the Old Testament, when people uh, start off with a passion, our tendency is to fall away, to backslide. Uh, and, and that's the great danger that Paul teaches and preaches about constantly in the New Testament that his passion was to finish the race and to, to run and not be deceived and to lift up his eyes and press on towards the upward call in Christ rather than mm -hmm. fall away and get distracted. So it's so easy in our lives to get distracted by being parents, by having a job, by social media. There's many, many distractions now, but things haven't changed. People haven't changed. And uh, we're pretty much the same. We need to have a disciplined heart and a determination to go on with God, which means consistent prayer, consistent mm -hmm. Bible study, consistently meeting together with small groups of people to encourage one another in the Lord. You mm -hmm. can look at a podcast, you can listen to somebody preach, but it's different than being one-on-one -on -one with a small group of believers who can share their passions and their heart for Christ and then pray for one another. That's yeah. where growth occurs. Okay, well, that was awesome, what you just said. But what I want to hear is, how would, I, how would I even know that I'm part of a church that is not following, right? What are some prime mm -hmm. suspects? What are the warning signs of, you know, and because I agree with you. I think a lot of, you know, uh, denominations that we have, a lot of things that started, 
right? Um, they had good intentions. And some along the way, they, they sort of forgot the basics, right, of what makes us who we are in Christ, right? Like they forgot prayer time and, and reading your Bible and spending time with the Lord. Um, so what are some suspects that would you say that, again, our whole point is not to go and start to criticize and because I think the unity of the church is mm -hmm. is important as long as we're united around you know Jesus, not about around something else. So, but what are some warning signs? What what do you see some of the the modern day trends even right that kind of point to say, hey, we are not following after Jesus. We have sort of veered into a different thing. So I asked you to come up with at least five points, like we're five different kind of tendencies for people to go one direction or another. Right. So okay. give us a little bit of insight of that. Okay. So let, mm -hmm. let's start with uh, the first one that mm -hmm. I identified I would call the prosperity mm -hmm. of the gospel church. Uh, the, the thought that godliness is a means to great gain. Mm -hmm. We saw this in Bulgaria when we were missionaries. Uh, communism had fallen apart and some pastors came over from America and they preached a, a very heavy... Uh, prosperity gospel, telling people if they just would give their money to the church, God would solve their problems. Uh, they'd give them a new car, a nice house, their wife would be happy. Uh, and you, they're only preaching one side of the gospel. There is no doubt that God brings joy mm. and fulfillment and contentment, but he brings godliness and contentment at the same time yeah. when you recognize that God pro pro provides for your needs, but not for your wants. Mm -hmm. So s some of the warning signs are preaching only one side of the gospel, mm -hmm. always talking about the blessings of being Christians, but overlooking the cost of discipleship, the admonition that Christ gave us to die to self, to pick up your cross, to follow him. Unless you're going to lose your life, you're not going to save your life. Yeah. And there's going to be suffering for Christ. If they persecuted him, they're going to persecute you. So if you're measuring your godliness by how many people like you and mm -hmm. everybody likes you, then you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so um, about that $5 million jet, um, it's a no? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so what are the warning signs when yeah. you're sitting in that church? If you always hear, please forgive to my ministry and you'll be blessed, send your checks in and we'll take care of everybody else. Yeah. If you see people who are proud and always talking about me and what I've done instead of how awesome Jesus is and what God has done through his amazing power, that's a check. If you see people who are talking about serving the Lord, but they're living a very life lavish lifestyle, yeah. flying around in jets and having 5,000 pairs of shoes in your closet, you know you got a problem. Yeah. Many times, if there is a huge following, an enormous ministry, that's usually a sign that they're not preaching the whole gospel because Jesus said that there would only be a remnant. Yeah, yeah. And frankly, few. everybody wants a Savior. I love this statement. Everybody wants a Savior, but few are willing to pay the price for lordship. Yeah. God's calling us to make him Lord of all. And if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Yeah. But that's not a popular message. It's not one that brings him in because the natural heart is to want to call our shots and drive our car and be in control. And Christ is calling us to follow him, let him control and direct us and lead us and guide us and trust that he'll bring yeah. about good. One point of clarity that I want to make here, um, you said if it's a big ministry, obviously we don't mean that, oh, if it's a big ministry, automatically it's not of God. It's usually because if they preach a gospel that's all about you, then you'll attract a bigger crowd because you see Jesus preaching, you know, uh, and, and everyone just loves when he gives the, the bread and he, they see the miracles. But the moment Jesus talks about picking up your cross, the moment Jesus says you have to leave you know everything behind the moment you start seeing a whole bunch of disciples <laughs> right like or people that call themselves to be followers of jesus they left him you know so a lot of the ministries that preach only the hey god wants the best for you you're gonna be blessed you're gonna be don't stress because you're blessed and so on and so forth you, it's good in the sense that like it's good it feels good for us but it's not really good for us in the long term you yeah. know so so i just want to bring a point of clarity there it, because 
people a lot of times preach only one side of the gospel that all has to do with stirring up your ego, there's going to be a big following, you know? But that's not just to say that, oh, after a specific number, <laughs> you're no longer no, no, godly. No, yeah. no, it, it doesn't have anything to do yeah. with that, yeah. but it's really the balance. Yeah. Uh, a healthy church should stress repentance. Yeah. Many prosperity gospel churches stress repent once, you're in, now you can just receive the blessings from God. Whereas Jesus says that if you follow me, I'm going to show you more and more of your heart. And as you get closer to me, yeah. then you're going to see more that you need to repent of. Yeah. And if you're not being convicted by your sin and your selfishness and your flesh, then you're blind to what God is trying to show you. Yeah. Because the closer we get to him, the more we see how holy he is and how desperately we need him. Yeah. Okay, next point. So we're on the second point. What, okay. would, what would you say, the next uh, kind of like warning sign? Okay, so uh, another type of church that we've been in, uh, mm -hmm. I would characterize as the liberal social gospel church. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, You'll note, and, and again, to, to see the difference, I point you back again to uh, the Bible, mm -hmm. to the book of Acts, to see how Christ was dealing with problems in society at the time. And it was always one heart at a time. It was bringing his mercy and his healing and his uh, freedom from bondage to people. Uh, and that was the catalyst. He wasn't coming against the Roman dictators. He wasn't protesting and saying they should have rights and not be treated so poorly like yeah, they were. Yeah. So uh, we have had a movement in this country for a mm -hmm. long time uh, demanding social justice, yeah. demanding gay rights, transgender rights. Uh, the church that started off confessing its sins now is confessing its rights. Okay? Mm. Christians lay down their rights. Christians love others unconditionally the way they are. Yeah. And in that way, they convey the true message of the gospel to people. Uh, so that's something that we need to look for. Also look for redefining terms that are used in the Bible, such as what is sin. Right? Mm -hmm. We have been in churches in the past where the pastors wouldn't clearly articulate how they felt about homosexual sin. They just wouldn't address it. Yet the mm -hmm. Bible is crystal clear. And yeah. when people, instead of saying it's an abomination to God, he made us man and woman, and he cares yeah. about us because of the sanctity of life and uh, his view of us as his bride, instead of that, to say that we should celebrate that gets us back to the book of Revelation, where we're told that in the end times, people are going to call good bad and bad good. Yeah. And uh, we see that happening sometimes. So the desire for social change uh, can be great, but it results from personal sanctification. Yeah. One of, one of the uh, examples that came to my mind of how that has worked in the past has been the Welsh Revival. Mm -hmm. In Wales uh, and in Scotland later and in the Great Awakening in the United States when people were impassioned on fire with the Holy Spirit, the bars emptied out. Uh, nobody was worried about pornography anymore. People were going to church and caring for one another and acting in a fashion that glorified yeah, yeah. God. And it didn't happen because of political persuasion. Now, there are times when politics have to be confronted. And we've seen that uh, when Take a stand and, when yeah. Wilberforce for 20 years fought against slavery, slavery yep. the evil of slavery in the world. And uh, it was a horrible, horrible fight. But he was victorious eventually because he persevered and didn't give up. But ultimately, it is one heart at a time. Uh, this Sadly, in some of these uh, churches that are stressing the political agenda, biblical Holiness is viewed as hatred, as homophobic, <laughs> as being judgmental or unloving. Uh, uh, we had an experience. We were on a cruise and sitting with another couple, and we happened to have our Bibles with us. And a man came up unannounced, and he pointed his finger at us, and he said, you're the reason that all these people are committing suicide. <laughs> Never been so shocked in my life. Yeah. You know? But uh, that's a lie that Satan would have you believe. Yeah. And, and so uh, th that is something that I think, again, you have to get back to uh, the source of truth. Look at what the Word of God yeah. says, and then try to live your life in a fashion that honors government, uh, 
pray for the people that God places in positions of authority. Uh, when, if somebody says, you got to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, then you say, well, uh, if, if it's okay for you, yeah. you do what you want, but we're going to obey God. But yeah. the government can be difficult. I've seen so many times where I think a lot of people are even, they really try to stay away from words like going to the cross and repentance and uh, what is sin and, you know, even the word abomination and like all these, you know, all these words that now they're not politically correct. Exactly. Um, but in the moment you utter them, the moment you're considered either, you know, someone who is archaic someone that is not very relevant. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, you're not saying those words because you're trying to bash on people. You're saying those words because you actually love people and you know that sin destroys, you know, human lives and, and sin does not have a place in the church of the living God. And, and now we got so comfortable because quite frankly, we don't really have a lot of people that call us out on that. You know, that that the kind of like the preachers that w- would not be afraid. They're so afraid of man that they're not afraid of God, so, you know. And what we need to, to, to have is preachers who will tell us the whole truth. I think it's extremely unloving if you're lying to people, right? So if you just tell people what they want to hear, that's not being loving. That's actually being hateful because you're not telling them. It, it's kind of like if someone's house is on fire, but you're too nice to tell them that exactly. they're about to die. Exactly. You know, no, run in there and pull them out, even if they're angry at you for that moment. You know, so I, uh, wow. So in this in this place, where is the place of holiness? Because even if you're mentioning the word holiness, again, now it's like, I barely ever hear about that. And, and that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about at the end of this when I get to yeah. the Laodicean lukewarm church. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but that is such a central theme of the Bible. And when we were young Christians, we followed this elderly couple, and uh, they happened to mention about being holy. We, we mentioned about being holy, and uh, their response was, well, we can never be holy. I don't try to do that. But... When you look at what the Word of God says, it's clear. Be holy as I am holy. How how do we Mm -hmm. do that? Well, uh, when you empty yourself and be filled with the love of Christ and he lives in us and through us, then it's possible. We will never be as holy as Christ. But he calls us to be holy as he is holy, be sober, gird up our loins. There's all sorts of scripture in there that talk about making lifestyle choices that are inconsistent with what the word is doing, what the Mm -hmm. world is doing, and what uh, some churches are advocating as just fine because it feels good. And and sadly, that's the way it is. But it's, again, you need to go back to the Bible and have that be your uh, source of truth and then ask God for discernment to see where am I and is this where I should be uh, and help me be who you want me to be even in the midst of where I am. Because we stayed in a lot of these churches many, many years, Mm -hmm. begging and imploring and pleading with the leadership to please be open and honest about what the word says. Uh, So you you can't give up. You need to be where the Lord wants you to be, because I can promise you there's no perfect church. Yeah. uh, Just a bunch of imperfect people who are trying to please God and live together. So uh, on to the next church. Well, we we would have a perfect church if we didn't have people in it, but because people are not perfect, <laughs> there will be a perfect church someday when the yeah, new Jerusalem exactly. comes down from heaven and Christ is reigning. Okay, this one is um, this one hits really close to home. Uh, this is this one's a tough one because I grew up in the charismatic movement, right? I mm-hmm. I grew up a Pentecostal, and and again, like you know, this is again really close to my heart. Where do you see the movement, like the overly charismatic movement? Because the word itself, charisma, is not a bad word, you know. But where are the dangers within, like, you know, this movement? I thank God for the charismatic movement because Mm -hmm. it freed me from a church that I got saved in, which knew all about the love of God and Mm -hmm. nothing about the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so because of that, because the pastor preached six months on the Holy Spirit, but then the end said, but I don't think he's real because I have never heard his voice. 
<laughs> so we stayed there and yeah. tried to get them to open up. They didn't, and so God moved us on. And where he moved us on to was a charismatic movement that mm -hmm. was started by a guy named John Wimber down in Anaheim, California. And it really spoke to my heart because he was a musician and he had a passion for anointed scriptural worship and praise. Yeah. And that opened up my heart and understanding to why God had given me the ability to play the guitar and why I love to sing. So what is charismatic church gone awry? We call it charismaniac. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's when what started as a revival yeah. goes astray. When a move, a true move of God devolves into manipulation by men seeking mm -hmm. recognition and power and control over other people. So uh, one of the main uh, moves of God that people in our country know about happened in Azusa, California in 1907. It's 113 years ago that the Holy Spirit was poured out there. There was a man there named Frank Bartleman who was the Holy Spirit reporter. He was the revival reporter that was going to talk about mm -hmm. what was happening at Azusa Street. And in a tract that we found recently from 1982 where David Wilkerson was concerned about having a Pentecost that wasn't focused yeah. on Christ, <clears throat> he quoted from this man. And I thought it was a powerful, powerful quote. Mr. Bartleman wrote, we may not hold the doctrine or seek an experience except in, in Christ. Christ. Many are willing to seek power in order to perform miracles, draw attention and adoration of the people to themselves, thus robbing Christ of his glory and making the fair showing in the flesh. The greatest need would seem to be for true followers of meek and lowly Jesus, religious enthusiasm easily goes to seed. The human spirit so predominates the show off the religious spirit, but we must stick to our text, Christ. Mm. If you've ever grown a garden so in the Northwest, planted your vegetables and then had a cold time, those things that you hoped would bring fruit go to seed and die. Mm -hmm. And that's sadly what happens sometimes. So we've seen that. Wimber's movement got off. They started overemphasis of signs and wonders yeah. and prophecy. As we were about to go to Bulgaria, we were attending another vineyard church, and they brought in some people that later became known as the Kansas City Prophets. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought, oh, these people are really, really godly people. Yet later on, things came out that showed that their walk was not consistent with their talk, that their mm -hmm. prophecies weren't correct. They were living despicable lifestyle and taking advantage of people. So you, you have to look at the hearts of the people and what's going on. Another example mm -hmm. is the Toronto Blessing that happened uh, in the mid-90s. People were flying to Toronto to experience this uh, outpouring yeah, of the Holy yeah. Spirit. We had friends that went uh, and godly people. And we asked them, well, what do you think? Was, it, was the Lord there? And there's one woman who we got to know when we were with Times Square Church for three weeks in 94. She said, if you're looking for God, you could find him. But there was just so much off. The laughing gospel, another thing that has come yeah, yeah. along, people would be slain in the spirit, drop on the floor, writhe around like snakes, laugh uncontrollably. The pastors that are supposed to be preaching and teaching the people yeah. are up there laughing hysterically, claiming it's a move of God. If you look at the New Testament, you'll see that Paul preaches time again about order in the church and how tongues are good, but don't have speaking in tongues in church unless somebody's going to prophesy yeah. to and translate that so that it will edify everybody else. So these are some of the problems well, that you see. One thing I wanted to mention when it comes to a few, a few of the things that you, you just mentioned, um, when I look in the New Testament, it's written that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Yes. Right? Exactly. Yep. And when I see people that are rolling on the floor and they're laughing, supposedly they're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, I look at that and I'm like, where exactly is the fruit of the Spirit called self-control in all of this? Right? To me, it's always been problematic. Now, of course, I'm sure there's answers people have to this, and I'm sure we can justify it, but to me, I can never get over that. How can, you know we act in such a way when the one of one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control yes you know that, that is a, what are some other warning signs about this movement that uh we should look into 
I, I think one uh, uh -huh. that is a broad characterization, but it's illustrated many, many ways in different mm -hmm. uh, churches that you can look at is seeking the gifts more than the giver. Yeah. Okay. It's a big uh, one. It's a huge one. And there is such a desire for uh, power, for signs, for miracles, for healing, that everybody's looking for these things yeah. instead of seeking Christ. Jesus, when he came, uh, made it very clear, you know, <laughs> seek first the kingdom of God. And then yeah. all these other things that you need will be added to you. But if if you're looking for gold dust falling from the ceiling or, you know, wanting to know how to heal people by laying hands on them and get it down to a formula, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, true Christianity is not just an emotional experience that comes out of powerful music or manipulation by somebody. Yeah. Uh, it is it is a move that's birthed and often expressed in brokenness and repentance and humility and then followed by joy. The joy yeah. of our salvation is a real thing that everybody who really knows the Lord uh, understands personally. But uh, when our focus gets off and we're just looking for signs, wonders, et cetera, uh, th that's not the true church. Yeah. We're, we're Okay, so then there's a tendency, right? Like once you have been here, right, where and the charismatic sort of movement, because that, that's how I grew up. For me, I would say from maybe 20 to 25, there was a tendency to run the other direction, right? Like I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> I want to go and like it's all about text. It's mm -hmm. all about, you know, exegesis. It's all about, you know, and so I, I went into sort of the other extreme where it's like I want to, you know, I. I still attended a Pentecostal church, but I started to identify myself more with the uh, intellectual, I would say, right? Like, I think you even mentioned it too, like the intellectual church, where it's all about, you know, only exegesis of scripture with not a lot of signs and so on. What does this danger, you know, what, what does this movement, what are the dangers in this movement? So the, the intellectual church is very interesting, uh, and I think the, the biblical example of it mm -hmm. is found in the New Testament when Jesus was walking around Jerusalem confronting the Pharisees and the scribes. Mm -hmm. They knew the Bible at that point was the Torah and, and the rest of the book of the Old Testament, and they knew it very, very well. They could quote the verses. Yeah. They were busy following the rules, but when the Messiah came and stood before them, yeah. they didn't recognize him because they had no relationship with God. It had been 400 years since God had spoken to the church in Malachi. So they had this big dead period. We have known people who are great Christians, really, really trying hard. They know the word really well, but they've never heard the voice of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so they can't grasp or come to terms with the scripture when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And that's, Part of the balance that we have to have, uh, some of these intellectuals think, mm -hmm. well, uh, they're called dispensationalists, that mm -hmm. you know, that was only for New, New Testament specific times, time, yeah. specific time. God doesn't do signs and wonders. He doesn't heal people. He doesn't uh, have this big anointing anymore, so they don't have the faith to believe it. And so it doesn't happen in their hearts. It doesn't happen in their lives. And they don't see those things. Uh, it's... There's a huge, huge difference that uh, it took me years to understand, the difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing, knowing Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. And, and that is something that comes clear if you spend some time in the Word, uh, if you want to go to Philippians chapter 3 yeah. and see how Paul feels about knowing Jesus. And to me, that is a lifelong goal that I have had and will continue to have until I die, I can never know him well enough. I want to know him more. I want to be found in him and known by him. The worst thing in the world that you can read in the Bible is for somebody to die and stand before the Lord and say, oh, Lord, I did all this stuff in your name. And to have Jesus look at you yeah. and say, I didn't know you. Yeah. That's, that is the, the tragedy of the purely intellectual church. So you have to have a balance of the word to be your foundation and your guideline and of the Holy Spirit to bring it alive. And when those two function together with the right balance, then God is glorified, his truth is proclaimed, and people are set free from the fear of man and can preach and power and share 
their testimony about what yeah. God has done in their own life. Yeah, and then again, so we saw the two dangers on one hand, Pentecostal, and then the other hand, like the intellectual. And then there's the third one that sort of says, I want nothing to do with this wore this i'm just gonna be lukewarm <laughs> i'm just gonna yep. be somewhere not even the middle i'm not even gonna play i'm gonna take my toys and go home type of thing <laughs> and so I, and and i think if i look at my life i think i've had season in every single one of them right where it's like you get to a point you're like well who's right apparently nobody's right nobody's wrong you know and and sort of become this postmodern like oh I, i'm just gonna do my thing you know and so how is that movement, how can you recognize it? What are some of the warning signs for the lukewarm church? I think the lukewarm church is probably the biggest danger faced by American Christianity because so many people, uh, there's very few people caught up in the fringes on one side or right. the other, but the vast majority of people, and, and I speak this from experience because the first church that I attended was very much this way. Uh, they were loving but they were never really passionate. Mm -hmm. They were uh, talking about God. The mm -hmm. sermons were biblical, but as soon as the sermon was over, you'd go into the narthex and people would talk about the Seahawks or uh, sports or where I'm playing golf or what my vacation was or my new car and that sort of thing. So uh, you have a lot more promotion of worldly lifestyle mm -hmm. and worldly programs with a Christian veneer. Mm. Okay, that's really sad uh, when people put just enough Christianese on their program to make you think that this is God, but really it's just a mother daughter dance or, you know, we're going to celebrate Mother's Day or have a fashion show. Yeah. You know, look at the kind of things that the New Testament church was doing and then contrast it with what's going on in the lukewarm church. It's remarkable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Within that church, there's a prevailing view that you only need to repent once because having done it, you're saved. And so being saved of salvation, you really don't have to do anything but enjoy life and uh, try to be a nice guy to your friends. But uh, as you know, that's so contrary to yeah. uh, the cross of Christ. Follow him at any expense. Lose your life. The other thing that is often preached in the lukewarm church is don't judge me or you'll be judged. <laughs> well, it's a church devoid of discernment because people in leadership are saying we can't judge anybody else because that means you might be judged and everybody knows yeah. that they don't want to be judged because they know about all their own sins. They just won't admit them. So uh, that's a, a big flag. The other thing in a lukewarm church, there's a, an emphasis on pursuing happiness mm -hmm. instead of holiness. Mm. Uh, everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants a savior, but, uh, very few people want a Lord. Mm -hmm. There's no focus on prayer. There's very little discipleship going on. Paul talks about this when he's bemoaning the fact that most of the congregation that he was speaking to were babes in Christ. They were still having the pure milk of the word they ought, when they ought to be eating meat and being mature and going on in Christ. That sort of thing needs to happen in a church because people can't make disciples unless they're a disciple. Yeah. So our goal, according to Jesus in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, is to go into all the world and make disciples and be disciples. And you got to grow yeah. in order to be discipling someone. I encourage people in your walk through your life as a Christian, try to find somebody to be a Barnabas, an older man who can disciple, disciple you, you and a Call younger you out. person like Timothy, <laughs> like Timothy, that you can encourage yeah. and share your war stories and what yeah. you've been through. Yeah. So I'm happy to have my Timothy here <laughs> and, uh, at my stage of life to be uh, a bit yeah. of a Barnabas for him. Yeah. Another scary thing is that the lukewarm church, and this is almost a direct quote from Revelation 3.14, says that they are oblivious to their own spiritual yeah. poverty. They think they're rich but they have no clue how poor they are. But there is a cure to that that is universal, that it was promulgated and proclaimed by John the Baptist, by Jesus when he came out of his 40 days of testing, by all of the apostles. And the cure is be zealous and repent. Yeah. Recognize yeah. that I've been lukewarm and ask God to turn up the flame and help me hunger and thirst for his righteousness, his holiness, 
that he would be glorified and that I would know him more. Yeah. What a joy. I want to mention one thing here in conclusion. It, there's a, there's a, always a tendency to look at all these things and say, well, there's just so much, right? There are so many extremes. But the good news is that we are invited into his presence. And the church of the living God is his bride. The church of the living God spreads throughout history, different cultures. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not bound by the four walls of a building, right? The church of the living God is a, you know, gathering together of believers. And we are encouraged not to forsake that fellowship. We are encouraged to come and, and serve along. I don't think you can be a true Christian unless you are part of his church. Mm -hmm. The church of the living God, it wasn't my idea or Chip's idea. It was Jesus' idea. He's the one who is building his church. You know, in the church, yes, there will be times you will be hurt. But this is also a time where you can learn how to forgive, how to grow, mm -hmm. how to live a life according to the principles and the calling of God. So this whole podcast is not to discourage you from become part of a church. No, this is more of a podcast for you to say, hey, where are the dangers? Where are the movements that I might be part of right now? And I'm oblivious to these extremes. And I might be following a movement, a person, something that is not Jesus himself. So I want to just take maybe a couple minutes here and just kind of remind it and remind everyone that is listening to me via, you know, podcasting, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, where the church should be. And maybe we can compress the introduction that we've talked about, how it should be about Christ centered. So what are some other things that we should be focusing on as a church? Because I know we talked a lot, a lot about other extremes, but what would be some of your last words that you want to tell people about, you know, about the church? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is one that many people miss, miss mm -hmm. and I think we need to focus and understand this yeah. because uh, it is so clear. God didn't make any mistakes when yeah. he made you. You are unique. Mm -hmm. You are equipped. Mm -hmm. God has given you talents. You may have more talents or fewer talents than yeah. somebody else. The only thing that matters is whether you are using your talents and whether you're using them properly for the glory of God or using them for your own purposes. So uh, Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship yep. created in his image for good works that he's created before time that we should walk in them. And so whether you are an eye or an ear or an elbow or an ankle, it's all important because if the body of Christ has a limp because the ankle is broken, it's not going to function properly. Yeah. So all we can do is function in the role that God has given us by loving others, by being focused on Christ and asking him to give us a servant's heart, a ongoing lifestyle of repentance and dependence mm -hmm. on, Christ. on Christ. We need to de be dependent upon him. When we are weak, he will be our strength. Yeah. When we need to go into battle, he's the one that's going to be Jehovah Nisi going ahead of us, and he's going to fight the battles. All we have to do is keep our focus on him and praise him and know that he's in control. And yeah. that equates to a deep, deep walk of faith. The Bible's really clear. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Anything that is not of faith is sin. And so ask God to show you your place. Ask him to show you how you can use the talents that he's given you under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then ask God to be glorified in your life as you seek to love him by loving others. Amen. Well, with that said, thank you so much for watching this podcast. Or if you listen to it, thank you so much for listening. Chip, thank you so much for being on here. Looking God forward pleasure. to other ones that we're going to do in the future. Praise the Lord. May God bless his word and work in the hearts of all of us. Awesome. Thank you. Take care.